Let's talk about it. All right. <laughs> so you're from Brooklyn, New York, right? Yeah. What, what was it like growing up there? Um, growing up in Brooklyn is, um, I would say it's tough, but it's humbling as well, too, um, especially the part I'm from. Uh, so I'm from East New York, Brooklyn, to be specific, which is like, a, you know, in the time I was growing up, it was a pretty poverty-stricken neighborhood, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's very humbling because, you know, you, you learn certain principles of life, I would say, at an early age um, that you might have not learned till you were older, depending on where you grew up, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and then I was also blessed, too, because I got to... I got to go to school in Queens during my, me growing up. And, um, you know, so I represent Brooklyn and Queens. Um, but, you know, growing up in Queens allowed me to see a little bit more diversity than what I was uh, usually used to. So it allowed me to kind of build my people skills, so to say, as far as like the different types of people. You know, I grew up in a predominantly black and Puerto Rican Latin neighborhood. I'm Puerto Rican descent as well. So, you know, sometimes like being from my hood and where I'm from is like you get caught on like a specific block or bubble and you don't really get to know people outside of that circle. So growing up, uh, going to school in Queens, you know, kind of helped me be able to associate myself with different types of groups. So um, that ultimately led me to being able to do what I do now and have, you know, a variety of different fans, um, people I do business with as, as an entrepreneur in the game as well too so you know blessed to be from both places um because they both taught me something really great okay now would you like to share with us the story of at the age of 17 the event that happened in your life oh yeah for sure that was another humbling experience um I was shot in the, in the right side of my face by a straight bullet um you know just being at the wrong time wrong place uh when I was about 15 years old, my mom decided to leave Brooklyn and she wanted to move to Pennsylvania, Allentown to be specific, because she wanted to, uh, she had dreams of buying property, you know, as every, you know, mother that's raising multiple kids in New York, when it gets too expensive, you know, they search for other options. So, um, you know, we, we left out there. I, I did about maybe like two years of schooling out there. And then this happened maybe like a few weeks before, um, my graduation um and yeah it was a uh, one of those moments that was really like um you know like a highlight moment in my life I would say uh because it teaches you a lot you know it was like I said it was a humbling experience you know I um I still live with the bullet every day in my nasal cavity so they never actually removed it or did any surgery um it just actually healed while I was in the hospital for like I think it was like a week's time, maybe less, like four days, five days. Um, and yeah, it was a miracle from what the doctor said, you know, from the range where that gentleman uh, had shot the gun, you know, um, it broke through the window of the car and then it went in my face. And, you know, he said if it, that guy would have been like one step further back or one step closer, it could have decided my fate. Um, you know, and in a moment like that, you, uh, you know, I kind of see my life flash in front of me, like from beginning to end, no matter how weird that might sound. Um, and I definitely felt like my angels and my presence. Um, but what that ultimately led me to do was when I was in the hospital, you know, they don't, uh, Pennsylvania doesn't allow family members to stay overnight. Oh, wow. So I had to deal with that myself, you know, the trauma of that, um, and I made a decision while I was there. I was asking myself, like, you know, I, at that time I was already like pursuing music from the recording sense, but I wasn't necessarily um, pursuing it in the career wise. Like I still, well, maybe I was, but I wasn't like so gun ho on like, yo, I'm going to give up everything for this. Right. Um, and when I was in the hospital for those few days, I decided like, all right, you know, high school is about to end. You know, I want to go back to New York, the place I love. You know, Pennsylvania wasn't really for me. It was a very small town, and I had um, very big thinking, you could say, or big city thinking. Um, so then I moved back, and I left home at 17. I lived by myself. Um, left my moms and my brothers and sisters. and You know, I left, like, 
the comfortable choice, right, for something that wasn't as comfortable, which was living by myself at an adolescent age and just figuring it out, you know, but I did that all in the pursuit of music. I went to the college, community college for music engineering. I used that really as an excuse to kind of like network and, and uh, get myself back to New York. And, you know, that's what I pretty much did. And then, you know, fast forward all these years, it was the right choice because, um, you know, I chose the, the, the path of uncomfort, being uncomfortable um, to evolve myself, if that makes sense, and grow up, you know? Yeah, it does. I mean, that's what a lot of people go through. I mean, you have to get uncomfortable in order to get to your destination, to get where you are today. 100%. So, good thing you did. Yeah, I'm so <laughs> happy that I have chosen that. Yeah. You know? Was there any particular event that happened in your life that led you to rapping? Um, yeah, when I was about 10, um, one of my neighbors in East New York used to come downstairs and he used to rap in Patois and, um, I didn't understand it at first. So every week he would come downstairs, he was rapping the same fucking rhyme over and over and just the different beats. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I got to give him credit because one day you know i used to always for some reason i used to always buy the instrumental tapes of uh, like um the high 97 instrumental tapes and i don't know why i would do it but i just liked production before i even thought of writing anything and then one day i was playing a video game and i said when this motherfucker come downstairs the next time i'm gonna have some shit ready for him but then when he wrapped that same rhyme i'm gonna kick some shit um so that's kind of what kicked it off but i, I was still having hoop dreams to like the age of 15 and when I moved to Pennsylvania um I didn't register into school for like three months until after I lived there and my grandfather who I just spent the whole summer with passed away right when I moved like literally the second day I, I touched down in Pennsylvania so I didn't know oh thank you I appreciate it yeah I didn't know where to uh play basketball indoors right so the thing that I gravitated to immediately was my pen and my pad um, in the attic of this uh, room that I was in in Pennsylvania and um, the first week I get registered into school you know New Yorkers we stick out like a sore thumb especially in high school I was very on my uh, flamboyant you could say dressing like I was dressing like the NBA players dress now, <laughs> you could say, um, walking out the tunnel. I was very into my fashion, still am, um, as you see, <laughs> all the preseason. Um, but uh, yeah, so in that moment, somebody asked me, hey, like, what do you do? You know, and I'm like, um, you know, I play basketball, I rap, I dress. You know, and this kid happened to fucking have the biggest mouth of school. He told a bunch of different rap crews, like, yo, this kid from New York, he could rap. So the next couple of days, I just had a bunch of rap crews approaching me. And ironically, the kid who had the big mouth walked me to my, my house, maybe second or third day from school. And one of his best friends, ironically, lived right next door to me, like literally right oh wow and he became my, one of my best friends so we we started our own rap group and we joined forces with one of the poaching rap crews and we kind of like merged um and then yeah from there i like completely dropped basketball because one of the members of the group actually was like yo the way he kind of reeled us in was like yo i actually got a real studio to access and i was like shit you know, I've never actually recorded, recorded. I used to record on my computer. I used to download the beats and use like voice recorder to rap <laughs> over them and do my demos like that. Um, so yeah, you know, that happened. And then the first day I uh, jumped in a booth, it was pretty much a rap. I never looked back. Oh, wow. You know, it only I takes a like, moment. Yeah, I'm usually not that type of person, you know, uh, but with this, it was like very uh, therapeutic, you know, um, it was very expressive. Uh, I felt also a way of like releasing um, 
you know, my thoughts where people can understand me better through music versus even maybe me talking, you know? Mm-hmm. Music is like a trance in communication. Yeah. Language is like, you know, just communication, right? Yeah. Um, so the emotions and how you come across sometimes are a little bit different. Okay. Has there ever been a time where you felt rejected or felt like you just want to give up music overall? Uh, well, the name of my whole, uh, you know, mission statement and my company is called Reject Dream. So all the time I feel rejected. Um, that was, you know, the, I, I created that when I was 15, that name, um, I have it tattooed on me. You know, that's been like my life's purpose in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, I want to say to the point I wanted to quit. But I've always faced being the underdog for sure. Um, you know, going through an industry that's predominantly driven by like fake gangsters and, you know, like sometimes sex, money, and drugs. You know, I've always been like unconventional. Like I'm telling the POV of the struggle and the grind, um, but I'm selling it from a very blue collar sense. So my fans could be from, you know, I've had fans that have done stuff, you know, jail bids. And then I have fans where it could be like young ladies like yourself who graduated from Yale or like Harvard or, you know, um, different colleges for journalism, right? Mm -hmm. um, then some fans are like visual artists. So I've always, uh, you know, had like a different approach on on, on things, you know? Um, that's what also led me to like mi start mixing my music with actual visual art because I wanted to give people an experience. But yeah, the industry kind of puts you through like, a, it always does, no matter how, um, you know, seasoned you are, it puts you through a ring of like obstacles where it's like, yo, how bad do you really want it, you know? And I never quit because I love music too much. I would never quit on music. The business, there's been some times where I want to say I wanted to quit, but the thought crosses the mind of, wow, man, like all of this shit for this, like for the politics or, you know, um, you know, the weight on, on my shoulders. And, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people in this industry, like you have a few, those that are few and far between that actually have a lot of vision and taste. And then a lot of the industry is built on, and, and even fandom sometimes is built on sheep culture. You know, people have, I remember, I, I'm from an era where, like the blog era, where you discover music and it was your job as a journalist or a reporter, right? Or even just as a music enthusiast to go out there and freaking scour the earth to find who you thought was next and put people mm -hmm. up on that. And I remember the first time I discovered Kendrick or Drake or Cuddy, and I was like, yo, these are the next people. Right. And I would take pride in that. Like I was in, at Kendrick's first show in New York. Right. Nowadays, it's more so like people being told what to like, you know, like, oh, this artist is signed to this artist. This is why, you know, or like carbon copy artists. Right. Respect to all the thugs and futures and gunners of the world. But there's like a million of cop the copycats of that, you know, and um I understand why people like it, you know, it's a guilty pleasure, something familiar, um, but that is the type of thing that has a wear and tear because if you're looking, if you're looking to be an authentic individual and artist, you know, you have to break through that noise when in the golden age of hip hop and rap music, it was actually frowned upon to sound like somebody else, you know, now it's more embraced. So, you know, sometimes not, I don't want to say, the disappointing part is not people being inspired by to sound like a future or something like that, but it's almost, it's the industry that sits there and measures artists to those credentials where it's like, you know, dude, like you're making shit up. Like don't just because little Nas X blew up off a fucking meme. Don't tell every artist that won't be blew off. You need to create a meme. You know, it just doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a different path and way where they, you know, rise to the top. So, that's the one thing that probably annoys me the most about the industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you want to be yourself. You don't want to be like somebody else. 100%. 100%. So you talked about um, music as therapeutic. Is there anything else that you find that helps with your everyday life to get you out of your funk or whenever? What, like, what are the mechanisms do you use to cope? Uh, 
smoking weed, <laughs> um, <laughs> chilling with my dog, you know, people I love, um, going to museums, traveling, definitely been a big one. Um, you know, just came back from Hawaii, did like four months of traveling, doing shows in Denver, Austin, Miami. Um, yeah, it's been, been kind of crazy. Um, yeah, so that's really been like the, the, the therapeutic thing is traveling, being able to experience different cultures, you know, having friends in different places, seeing sights, you know. Um, I would say watching sports, that's something also that allows me to keep sanity when, you know, a comedy. I love, you know, Dave Chappelle or watching people like Funny Marco. If I'm having a rough day, sometimes I'll just turn on his YouTube and just bust out laughing, you know, <laughs> um, with, with different shit he does. Like, you know, so stuff like that to keep me kind of like light on my feet, I would say. Okay. So what motivates you to keep writing? Oh, uh, life. Life is my, I would say, you know, um, experience is my best uh, motivator for sure. The more I go through life, you know, the more I'm able to like, I uh, once compared like me being an MC or an artist is uh, as being almost like a photojournalist. You know, mm -hmm. I'm capturing the camera is my eyes, and I'm capturing life in front of me, and I'm I'm drawing back, I'm I'm relating back to those images, and then writing about you know, or freestyling. I do a lot of freestyling as well too on my records. Um, so you know. And my engineer and producer always has, uh, he's, he's funny because he's like, every time I travel somewhere, like when I came back from Italy, he's like, yo, I know you got mad, like Italy bars or like Hawaii <laughs> bars. Like I know I'm going to hear that shit like you were sitting in some mountain in Hawaii. He'd be right because I do come with a, a few bars or two, you know. <laughs> um, where you go. You got to oh, of course, of course. It's part, I, I feel like, um, you know, I live by this quote where it's like, it's not how far you've gone, it's the love you find along the way, mm -hmm. you know. Um, that again. You gotta almost, that again. Yeah, yeah, it's in my bio like a million times. It's also in the album description. Um, it's not the love you find, it's not the, how far you went, but it's the love you find along the way. Mm -hmm. So the love you find along the journey. And that's something that makes me always like speak about my travels because, yo, um, I could meet like an exec somewhere, middle of freaking... Canada or I could also just meet a homeless person and learn uh, from them you know what I'm saying so it's, it's always the journey yeah it is and I mean that's how you, that's how you too find your inspiration by going to different places knowing different cultures so yeah. 100% so outside of rapping you do write comic books uh well you could say I help write comic books um but what I've done over the years is because my name is Arts, um, and 10 years ago, I started changing my actual rap performances to be more like gallery setting events to where people come see me perform, but they actually see art on the wall, like uh, paintings, illustrations, uh, photography, you know, and I would spotlight different creatives within my community, my reject community. Um, so along that way, I started throwing paint parties in my apartment where um, I started putting murals uh, all over the walls and I would just invite artists to come paint the walls of my place. Um, and then I started saying, okay, you know what, with every song, I'm going to drop a painting or a comic book or things like that. So I would collaborate with visual artists um, because I can't draw. I direct and edit video. I'm a visual artist in that sense, but I don't know how to draw. Um, so I would connect with visual artists that I discovered or met along the way that I really enjoy their work and I would present them the music that I'm trying to do and then we would collaborate on what we wanted to create for it and sometimes I would just give them the music and let them just throw paint on the wall and see what comes out and be like yo that's dope maybe move this or fix this and kind of creative direct and then sometimes they'll be like the artists will just take it and do what they want kill it and then um, for some of the comic books, me and the artist maybe go over the dialogue together and, you know, cross reference and, and make sure like the visuals also speaking to the music and the music speaking to the visuals, you know? Okay. Well, tell us so about I'm, a I'm a curator. Oh, okay. Tell us about yeah. your latest music. Like what's the inspiration behind it? 
Alone in the Metaverse. Yeah. Um, the, the new album that drops on the 24th, I'm excited for it. Um, after this interview, I'm about to get into like a whole streak of busy. I'm producing four different events this week. So wow. it's going to get crazy. Um, but yeah, Alone in the Metaverse is um, inspired by like my last year in music and art and tech. You know, um, because I was partnering my music with visual art for so long in the last year, uh, the NFT space really gravitated to me um, and it changed my life in, to a lot of degrees. Actually, um, I was running up in Time Magazine, Yahoo Finance. I became the first blue chip rapper to ever sell in the auction house with Basquiat and Andy Warhol um, to sell an audio visual NFT. Um, I brought over 2,000 plus people out to my show in November and then I, in December for our Basel I actually produced a show where I performed and booked Busta Rhymes, Nori, Murder Beats, uh, Trinidad James brought out like over 5,000 plus people so the NFT space really combined with my music fan base and like became like this whole other thing um, and obviously you know the talk of Web3 and the metaverse had me thinking um, so in November I dropped a record with a, a singer named Ari Lennox. Uh, you might know her. Um, signed to J. Cole. And I found myself in a place where, like, throughout the whole year, I was throwing events for the community. And I was putting out music, but I wasn't... I'm always working towards something, you know, like an album or a project of some sort. Like, I'm a very album artist type of artist. You know, um, I feel like that gives me the opportunity to let newcomers and new listeners jump into my world, you know? Uh, so I was sitting there to myself and I'm like, damn, like I've been putting out some music and doing all these events, but I'm actually not working towards the project. So when I got back, I sat in and I was like, damn, like I need to start working towards something. And, um, you know, the idea came to me like I was doing a screening for the video with Ari Lennox and uh, the metaverse. And it was like an exhibition for like 30 people who were invited. We all were just walking around, avatars and stuff like that, conversating. And it was kind of crazy, but it was a very intimate conversation. It was almost like somebody took us on a private tour of a, a, a gallery of some sort. And we were all having like a really intellectual conversation. And some of the people, it was a funny moment because I was talking to my homegirl um, in the metaverse and somebody just like, ran up on us and just jumped in mid conversation and it kind of felt like the club like you know you're talking to a girl and dude just you know comes in and barges but right? mm -hmm. and I could tell that the person did it out of not being like they were kind of like maybe socially awkward or a little bit of an introvert and they didn't know how to like introduce themselves in the conversation so they just like barged in and you're in the metaverse so it's not like yo dude back up off me you know and do nothing like that so it made me start to like ponder with this thought that was like, you know, as we move towards like the future, um, you know, and as the last year in NFTs, like me throwing concerts on Clubhouse, having con holding conversation on Twitter spaces, um, I started to think to myself like, yo, in this day and age, a lot of people are introverted and socially awkward due to the technology, due to the pandemic, all these different reasons, right? Um, and I think we find a comfortability in being able to speak to each other on the internet, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the person on the opposite side of that computer or that phone doesn't feel alone or misunderstood, which goes back to being a reject and being a reject dreamer, right? So I sat there and said to myself, you know, I don't want to make a crypto um, I'm not like one of these rappers that's going to be like everything crypto, right? Like I'm an artist at the end of the day, a web two artist bridging the gap between web two and web three. And my mission is to be a global artist, right? So I sat there and said, I want to call the project alone in the metaverse more so to represent that as we step towards this future, you know, the goal is to never be alone, right? And no matter how much we get technically advanced, People are going to be still dealing with the things emotionally um, and within them, battling the war within um, what I like to call it, you know. So that's what the album really speaks on. It has like these different layers and vibes of me going through a journey, um, quote unquote, in life, but in the metaverse with my dog, Lucy. 
Um, and I'm in like this untapped land, right? Imagine like Will Smith and I am legend, right? But just with arts and Lucy. Um, and we're roaming around this untapped land going through different experiences and emotions through each of the records. And um, it's a special project for me, for sure, because, you know, I got Styles P on the album. I got Trinidad James on the album, a couple other special guests. And it just, you know, it just shows me like, you know, like even with the Styles P record, like my favorite artist ever was Biggie. Like I grew up on the locks, you know? So this experience that I've been kind of like living in life has been very surreal because some of the people I've looked up to, I've managed to make peers and friends and collaborators. And, you know, the album means a lot from that aspect because, you know, Throughout my journey, like a lot of people will tell you what you can't do, especially if you're not signed to a record label, or you're independent or they see it taking some time. Um, but people have really got to watch my documentation of the progress, you know, and that's what the album represents to us, that love I found along the journey and just making sure to stay, stay in that realm um, and not catch myself alone, you know? Yeah. I mean, you find but, a lot of people that, are alone in this world, but don't know how to express it. For sure. Find other people to connect with. So what you're doing is really Thank you. And yeah, you know, the truth is like, I am a loner to a certain degree too, you know? And I heard like, um, I forgot who it was. I think it was like Kevin Gates. Um, I heard him say that sometimes he prefers to be alone because of him, you know, being in prison and incarcerated. And I've never been incarcerated, but you know, I've, from being shot sometimes, you know, you prefer like your own space and your own time, right? Um, or you don't trust a lot of people, you know what I'm saying? But the, the that feeling of being alone could be, uh, you know, it's not a good one, but it's also sometimes one that's needed. And that's what this project talks about too, where it's like, yo, sometimes you need to be alone in order to grow into yourself and fully be able to love yourself. Mm -hmm. Because when you're able to keep, yourself as your favorite company like when i'm with me like shit i my best friends with me you know like when you start really loving yourself to that uh degree i think that's when you um you won't have to deal with the feelings of being alone so much you know what i'm saying yeah oh, so tell us where can people listen to your music where can people follow you on social yeah. media yeah, right now my IG got reported for impersonating myself, so I just oh. kind of lit. Oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. Um, but right now you can follow me at Reject Dreams. That's uh, the brand page, and I've, making, I've made it my personal account now. You can fo follow me at Arts is Artsy um, on Twitter, A-R-T-Z-I-S-A-R-T-S-Y. Um, all content, news, updates can be found at rejectdreams.com. Um, on Spotify or YouTube, you can just type in arts in all capitals um, and you can find me there. Same thing with Apple Music and any of the other social media platforms. Yep. And, you know, if you go on IG or rejectdreams.com, you can check out any NFTs, any merch. The album comes out June 24th. So mm -hmm. make sure you tune in and listen to that and vibe to that. There's going to be some videos that's coming out too. It's going to be crazy. The whole NFT collection that's dropping with it, about 13 different pieces of art. Um, and uh, yeah, I got this show on Wednesday at SOBs, um, which I'll be headlining, which I'm super excited for to actually premiere the album. Where can people watch that or see that? Um, they would have to come in, in the person until they see the video recap. We'll be filming it all, but um, if you're located in New York or anywhere in the near vicinity, you know, it's a free event. All you got to do is RSVP um, and, and pop out. Yeah. Okay. What's the link? How can people RSVP? Uh, you can go to my link in bio on Instagram. There's RSVP there, or you can go to rejectdreams.com as well. The flyer should be there. Um, and you can just fill out the Google form and that's it. Okay. One more question before you go. I know you're yeah, a busy sure. man. How do you balance work and life? Whew, I'm still trying to figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to you. I still, um, what I try to do is, uh, you know, yesterday, honestly, I prayed before I went to bed because I know it was going to be a really crazy week. Um, so, I, you know, I would say always having a conversation with God. 
um, or whatever you believe in, you know, love is higher. Um, but yeah, I would say like, also like a to-do list, you know, I recently got an assistant, so that's been helpful creating Google calendar, you know, just having things lined up and giving your time enough space to breathe too, you know, um, you know, if you would have told me, hey, this interview is at 7 p.m. tonight, I have an event at 8 p.m. So I would have told you, hey, I can't, you know, but because mm -hmm. it was like, okay, it's early in the morning. Cool. We can knock that out because we have enough time to breathe. I have my haircut appointment at three. Mm -hmm. I have to be at the event space at six. We got, we got some wiggle room, you know? Oh, I um, stuff in the morning, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Um, so yeah, like I would say just giving yourself enough time to, to, to do things, um, not trying to put too much on your plate, but also staying busy is good too. Um, prior, making sure that you separate prior, priorities from things that might be, you know, not priority so much, you know what I'm saying? And just stay in balance throughout it all, you know, but definitely breathe, drink a lot of water, you know what I'm saying? Um, and you know all the regular principles but yeah that that's that's how i would i would say to do things and just mainly with the thing i've been doing is i can gauge what is most important to me um by who i'm dealing with and how they respect my value and stand in my ground on that. like hey listen you want me to go two hours to perform and drive up there all right yeah, like all performances i have to be paid for so at this point, if you're not talking that, then you don't respect what I do enough. And so I can't do it. You know what I'm saying? Um, so sometimes you you weed a lot of stuff out when you put the value on what you do as well, too, because then people will be like, ah, you know, I'm I'm not for it, you know. And then I'm like, all right, then you might not be for me right now. At least. You know, it's okay. <laughs> Keep it pushing. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you can spin the block and we'll, we'll have a different conversation at a later time. You know? Right. Well, much success to you, Thank you. and everything that you're doing.